Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the NASA Alumni League First Thursday program for May 5th, 2022. I'm Stokes McMillan. Uh, happy Cinco de Mayo, everyone. Today, our speaker is uh, Paul Marshall, who's the Assistant Program Manager for Orion at JSC. Paul began his NASA career in 1980 at JSC working engineering analysis and testing of the space shuttle life support and spacesuit systems. He went to work at NASA headquarters in 1989 supporting Space Station Freedom Program Office and later served as a technical advisor to the NASA Chief Financial Officer conducting integrated program assessments across the NASA enterprises. Paul returned to JSC in 1996 in the International Space Station Program Office, working a variety of program integration, systems engineering, and business process integration assignments. In 2005, Paul was named Assistant Program Manager for, for Orion at JSC. And in this current assignment, he leads the planning and implement, implementation of the Orion programs long-term production and operation transi transition. He oversees the Orion production for Artemis III, and he integrates overall program affordability and sustainability strategies within Orion, and then all the other miscellaneous program management duties he does. So Paul has a BS in mechanical engineering from Rice and an MS in engineering management from George Washington University. So now let me hand the program over to Mr. Paul Marshall. Thanks, Stokes. It's really, really a thrill to, to, to talk to the NASA Alumni League. You know, this is a, this is a group of, uh, of all our former colleagues, bosses, um, and, um, and, uh, and, I, and, you know, we've, we feel very much, um, we are accomplishing things today that are building on the accomplishments that uh, you know that uh, that this group had, and and you know it's a it's an honor to do that. It's an honor to be part of the the same heritage, and to uh, and especially today, it's a great honor to to share what we're doing, uh, how we're how we've um, you know how we're proceeding, what's uh, what's happening here in the very very near future. So, um, so yeah, it's. Um, it's been an exciting time for us, and um, what I wanted to do, if that's uh, if we can indulge, I wanted to sort of set the mood with uh, with one of the many uh, videos that we produce uh, talking about Artemis in general, um, and uh, and I'll pick up from there with some uh, with an explanation of the uh, Orion specific and some of the the specific discussions about. Um, uh, about the Artemis missions that we're uh, that that we're building up to, if that's all right. So, let's do that. Spend a little bit of time and um, go ahead, Brad. Through Artemis, the twin sister of Apollo, we are returning to the moon. This is Orion the only human-rated spacecraft in the world. Capable of deep space travel. And now, the Space Launch System, NASA's most powerful rocket since the Apollo era, stands ready. Having undergone and passed numerous tests, the time has come to complete the journey. With hardware originating from every state in the nation and from partners around the world, Artemis I will be the first flight test of each of these components now assembled together. These two solid rocket boosters will provide more than 75% of the thrust necessary to leave Earth. Each booster stands 17 stories tall a full segment more powerful than the SRBs of shuttle. Together, these boosters are capable of 7.2 million pounds of thrust and will burn for the first two minutes of flight. The core stage, at 212 feet, is the tallest rocket stage NASA has ever built. With the rocket's flight computer secured inside, 
core stage is designed to hold 2.3 million pounds of fuel. The 196,000 gallons of liquid oxygen and the 537,000 gallons of liquid hydrogen will combine to provide eight and a half minutes of propellant to the four massive RS-25 engines mounted below. As proven workhorses of the shuttle fleet, each RS-25 engine has a legacy all its own. Together, these four engines provide two million pounds of thrust, and with the SRBs, are capable of pushing Orion to a speed of 17,000 miles per hour. The interim cryogenic propulsion stage is a 45-foot tall upper stage that offers Orion nearly 25,000 pounds of thrust. Performing two separate burns, the ICPS will first raise Orion's orbit and then, later, propel it out on a trajectory to the moon. The ICPS is powered by a single RL-10 engine that will perform these two burns. This storied engine has propelled robotic missions to every planet in the solar system, including Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 the first space probes to reach interstellar space. Orion's service module, provided by the European Space Agency, is the powerhouse that fuels and propels Orion in space. It stores the spacecraft's propulsion, thermal control, electrical power, and critical life support systems, such as water, oxygen, and nitrogen. Orion's crew module is the pressurized segment of the spacecraft where future crews will live and work on journeys to the moon. Capable of accommodating four crew members for up to 21 days, this capsule includes state-of-the-art avionics, innovative crew systems, and the largest heat shield of its kind for entry back into the Earth's atmosphere. Positioned at the top of Orion is the launch abort system, designed to pull the crew to safety in the event of an emergency, on the pad or during launch. Three solid rocket motors can activate in milliseconds, accelerating from zero to 500 miles per hour in two seconds to propel Orion and crew safely away from the rocket. Now fully assembled, Artemis I stands at 322 feet. Artemis is no longer a series of separate parts and programs. United together, this is the first of Artemis's arrows, capable of ushering in the next chapter of human lunar exploration. Only together, this mighty system represents all that is possible, all that we are capable of when united around a stunning vision, with each component playing its part in a grander effort. We, the people of NASA and our partners, we, the people of the Artemis generation, all around this beautiful world, will bear witness to what we are capable of. Together, we are going back to the moon. Right, okay. Yeah, so, uh, um, Going back to the moon, I really prefer to uh, to talk about continuing the mission that was started um, by by this group of people, and and uh, we have a we have a sense of that uh, you know each and every day, um, you know that uh, that we started a great uh, uh, a great mission, and and uh, now we have the opportunity to to continue that mission. So, wanted to just kind of you know for those that might not be as familiar uh, maybe tell a few more stories about uh, the individual parts the video the video talked about uh, the elements of orion and and let me just start there again you know the crew module obviously the 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 um the iconic shape that uh, that uh, that proved itself so well during during the uh, apollo it's it's larger we can uh, we're we're designed to hold a crew of uh, four, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, the shape also, um, the arrow shape is is the back shell on the conical section is uh, is covered by um, shuttle-like tiles, and uh, and the bottom is uh, is covered by an orbiter. The, I'm sorry, the uh, Apollo-like ablative material called Avcoat, uh, chemically very very similar to that. Uh, some of the chemistry had to change. 
um, we, we install that av code in block form as opposed to the monolithic designed uh, approach that we had back in uh, back in Apollo. And um, and by doing that, we've uh, we've we've solved some of the the productivity you know, producibility aspects that uh, that made it so labor intensive back in the uh, back in the Apollo days. But um, but obviously, crew module has uh, has all the habitability, has the the communications, the um, uh, and um, and of course the uh, landing entry um, parachute system, et cetera, to uh, uh, to take care of the crew throughout the throughout the whole mission. Uh, the service module stays with the uh, the crew module for the whole mission. Um, the video uh, called it the European service module. It, the the majority of the service module comes from uh, our European partners. It's a direct extension of our uh, international partnership with the Europeans from the International Space Station, and um, it was a great opportunity to do that. And and it's the first step for uh, in in pulling the um, the the shuttle um, international partnership into the the planetary exploration that, uh, that that we'll be doing over the coming decades. The the forward ring with the NASA uh, worm on it there is actually made by the the United States. Our prime contractor, I meant to say, is Lockheed Martin for all the U.S. built hardware. Lockheed builds that uh, that forward ring. It's called a crew module adapter. It has uh, a lot of computer uh, computer equipment, but also the uh, the critical separation mechanisms with the uh, with the crew module. Um, the uh, the 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 narrow segment there is the uh, European service module. On the back, actually, are engines provided uh, by the U.S. Um, the main engine is uh, is Heritage uh, Heritage or, uh, Orbiter hardware for, uh, from the. Uh, the orbital maneuvering system, so the the Ohms engine. So we're we'll be flying out the inventory of uh, of um, orbiter uh, main engines. Uh, we also have eight um, uh, auxiliary engines on the on the back to give us some re um, functional redundancy on the back. You can see the um, um, you know I like to say that the um, the service module in general powers. Um, uh, propels, points, cools, and then stores commodity. And you can see the folded up uh, uh, solar arrays for uh, for generating electricity. Uh, and I mentioned the engines on the backside. You can see the smaller RCS engines um, uh, for attitude control. The 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 outside of that uh, that smaller uh, cylindrical section are uh, radiators. And then you can start seeing the tops of um, of propellant tanks, and we also have tanks for uh, a nitrogen, uh, a nitrogen, oxygen, and water uh, for servicing the crew inside. So, um, the um, the tower, of course, is the launch abort system. Um, it's uh, it's 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 uh, it's it's functionally similar to the abort tower that we had on Apollo, just uh, a lot more capable. We have. Um, we have those three solid rocket motors. Um, they actuate in 300 milliseconds from uh, from a trigger. Um, the abort motor has 400,000 pounds of thrust. It, it allows us uh, about 10 Gs of uh, of force for um, of acceleration away from the errant rocket for uh, about four seconds. At the top is a also it's a steerable uh, solid rocket motor, the attitude control motor. Uh, it's um, um, and that gives us a closed, um, close uh, capability for closed, uh, closed form um, uh, 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 trajectory tracking and steering from, uh, you know, to be able to uh, go on the trajectory that we want based on uh, based on the event. The other elements are are structural elements that uh, that we'll see in some of the upcoming photos. But uh, here's a little bit. Hopefully, I'm getting the. I'm trying to. Hey, Red, can you help me? I'm trying to get this to move up. Um, sorry about this. By the way, I wish we were together so we could all we could all see each other. It's a little, a little easier to interact. Uh, here's a little bit of data from um, uh, from the um, you know from the uh, uh, the in space orbiter. I'm sorry, in space Orion spacecraft. Um, obviously, you can see the um, the deployed solar arrays in that uh, in that graphic. Again, for exploration missions, we can uh, we're configured for four crew, 21 days. It uh, shows the the delta v. We can generate 11 kilowatts of uh, of electricity. And an important point of capability is it gives us 
we have 10 metric tons of what, what we call co-manifested payload capability, the ability to, uh, to, deliver, um, to, to deliver payload to the, um, uh, to the lunar orbit vicinity that, uh, that is a major part of building up the Gateway uh, Space Station that we'll refer to as, the, as this goes along. We have a little bit of, uh, a little bit of uh, lunar payload return mass capability that, uh, um, uh, that we'll be utilizing once we start uh, supporting lunar, lunar lander missions. Um, you can see some of the, the fun facts about our, our masses at launch and, uh, and all. And, and um, you know, we carry 19,000 pounds of, uh, of usable prop. Um, some of you know that in contrast with the, uh, with the Apollo uh, Command and Service Module carrying over 30,000 pounds. So uh, the architecture is very different um, and we, uh, we've, optimized, uh, we've optimized the, uh, the delivery in different ways, but that's a little bit of data there. Um, this is a graphic that, uh, that shows sort of the, the overall flight test campaign. Artemis 1 right there is what we're about to fly right in the middle. Um, but actually our flight test campaign started clear back in 2010 with, uh, with launch abort system tests. First uh, from, from the ground, we call them pad abort tests, you know, simulating needing to get off of the, the, the rocket even on the, uh, on the launch pad. <clears throat> um, uh, in the graphic, you can see that we, our, our campaign is, is demonstrating capabilities and retiring risk. All of the all the white text, if you if you look at that, is uh, are showing the new things that we're demonstrating every flight. And as we go left to right, um, you know the blue text is, are showing things that uh, that we've done before, and we're getting more experience as we as we go along. Um, but we started with the launch abort system back in 2014. We um, <clears throat> we had a, a an Earth orbiting uh, launch or Earth orbiting flight test. That gave us a a near lunar orbit um, uh, entry on you know, demonstration on the heat shield, but also some of the key separation uh, separation events, uh, demonstrating our separation capabilities uh, uh, in, uh, in at the system level, which are which are very difficult to do on the ground, of course. Um, and of course, to do all of that, we had to have the full system avionics and software, the first generation of software, many of the core vehicle systems, power, thermal uh, structures, um, you know, windows and other things that, uh, that we had to have in, in place. 2019, we had uh, an in-flight launch abort system test uh, that, uh, that showed our, our, our LES capability at, um, at the, the most stringent control point of Max-Q and max um, um, uh, so it, it, it showed that we were able to, um, uh, to steer through the, uh, the, the, the most difficult part of the, uh, of the flight regime at that point. So, so yeah, coming up in, uh, in just a few months, Artemis, uh, Artemis one, uh, primarily gives us, and this is an uncrewed flight, our first integrated flight with the, uh, with the SLS and, and, uh, and, and because of that, um, uh, we're flying it without crew, but uh, but uh, Orion was uh, was designed with that um, with that in mind. That gives us um, on this flight, it gives us the ability to do a full lunar velocity reentry on the on the heat shield and the TPS system. Um, it uh, we have a full up service module with the Europeans, so it's our first demonstration of that and. Um, and all the 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 lunar orbiting, uh, you know, uh, GNNC uh, uh, burn plants, and uh, all the integrated flight <clears throat> flight regimes that we need to get out of Earth orbit uh, into uh, uh, into lunar orbit and back out again and back uh, back home. So uh, it's an exercise of uh, of all the systems together, and and you can see some of the new things. Artemis two is our first crew flight, and um, uh, and uh, in, in general, the new capabilities there are the life support system and the crew displays, all the things that the crew will interact with. And of course, um, habitability uh, capabilities, you know, uh, being able to, to prepare food, et cetera. So, um, and then really to round that out, our Artemis three flight after that was, is, uh, it, it, primarily, the new capability is the docking and proximity operations capabilities that uh, 
uh, that we bring online because we actually need it. This is our first flight with a uh, with a lunar lander. Um, Orion will uh, will stay in uh, will stay in orbit, and um, and uh, and all four crew will go to go to the surface in the in the design that we have. So um, so that's uh, that's sort of the progression of things. This is um, this is a most of you are familiar with this um, this graphic uh, description we've done. We had this sort of thing in uh, in Apollo showing the the trajectory, but this gives us a a trajectory map of the Artemis One mission uh, that shows uh, obviously the launch and uh, and um, and and um, and lunar injection uh, lunar injection capability with the upper stage we call it the uh, the ICPS the interim cryogenic upper stage, but it's a it's kind of a uh, an upgrade of the the standard um, um, Delta IV heavy upper stage, the DCCS, I believe, um, is uh, is what they call it in uh, in the the Delta system. But um, but we have adapted that. That's our upper stage. Um, uh, it gives us the push to uh, to lunar orbit. We go into what's uh, what's called a distant retrograde orbit, a very high um, uh, high altitude orbit. Uh, gets us. Um, Gets it, it will actually project Orion to around 40,000 miles um, beyond the Earth or beyond the Moon, um, making it the uh, the farthest a, uh, a spacecraft a, a spacecraft designed for humans has ever been on um, on on this first flight. So, um, but the DRO, the di the distant retrograde orbit, gives us all the um, you know all the the complexity of uh, of trajectory management, uh, burn planning, getting into and out of orbit, and um, and um, and uh, and will th this mission will will range anywhere from 25 days to about 40 days, depending on when we actually get it off, um, because some of the other constraints that we're working with for um, lighting and um, you know for uh, for reentry, um, lighting for uh, for launch. To be able to uh, satisfy satisfy some of our other flight test uh, uh, objectives, if you will. So, um, so to get to this point for Artemis One, let me just kind of tell the story very quickly. Honestly, Stokes, I can't, I couldn't remember when we last uh, talked to the alumni league. Um, some of this might be a little bit of a of a repeat, but I'll just go very quickly. Um, you know, to get to this point, obviously Artemis One had uh, we 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 are qualifying. We we have finished qualification of of much of our flight system. Um, back in 2016, we started or 2017. We started a structural test article um, uh, test campaign up in Denver. This is a photograph from the uh, I believe the uh, the acoustic cell excuse me, the acoustic cell up there, we actually had uh, three and a half years of testing for all the different configurations of, uh, of Orion. Uh, we shook down all of those for, uh, for the, the structural acoustic and other tests that we did in, uh, in STA. Um, this is another test, which was a, um, a, a, a service module jettison panel, uh, uh, jettison test basically, uh, where we're, we're doing a shock test, but also showing the the interaction of the pyro and the um, uh, and the separation mechanism down at the base of the uh, of those jettison panels. Um, of course, you can see the the mock-up uh, uh, solar arrays on the uh, on the European service module there that uh, uh, gives you a little bit of idea. And we'll we'll have some better views of uh, of the whole stack here shortly. But uh, but that STA was um, was a very complete test. Um, over over a number of years, um, the uh, for those of you familiar with uh, with Sail, this is our Sail. We call it the Integrated Test Lab uh, that's located up in Denver at the Lockheed Martin plant. Um, this is our 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 full um, physical mock-up with the entire avionics system. We run all of our software in integrated. We have emulators with uh, with SLS with the ground uh, interaction with the ground software. Uh, the service module is all is, is all demonstrated in this uh, in this system. The service module avionics. Uh, we have some emulators that we receive from the uh, from the Europeans as well, and we have capability to and we're starting to to work those agreements to pull in emulators for 
uh, gateway lander and other other uh, exploration elements. So it becomes quite the uh, the integration location for uh, for exploration missions as we go forward. But uh, this is a 24/7 operation. Um, we have a number of uh, feeder labs, we call them, uh, that. Uh, that focus on, on other specific aspects, whether it's software development. Um, um, we have uh, uh, the, 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 main, um, the main processors uh, and, uh, and may, the core avionics portion of it in, in different labs where we can do some other offline uh, integrated tests. Uh, but, uh, and we have a portion of that capability here in Houston that we call the Hoth. Um, but uh, but we do have an integrated uh, hardware software test capability and we use it quite a lot. Um, uh, the Europeans built a um, uh, a simulated uh, a simulated propulsion system, service module propulsion system, called the uh, propulsion qualification module, and uh, that is most of the propellant uh, flow capabilities, all the all the, the the valves, the flow lines, um, getting you know getting a a full uh, wetted simulation of uh, of the flow passages from the tanks all the way to the engines. We had a, a an ohms engine, a, a live ohms engine, all eight uh, auxiliary engines, and about half of the RCS. So, so we were able to shake down um, at White Sands. This is a this is a photograph from the uh, from the White Sands test cell. Uh, we had a, a, a couple of years of really good tests down there, shaking down the system, and of course, getting the flow characteristics that are so important in a uh, in a monoprop system. Um, working through a lot of issues, I won't lie to you. We've had uh, we've had a lot of problems with these uh, with these very small um, valves that uh, that control the uh, the flows and. Uh, and working through those issues, it was very, very important to have this PQM uh, in our test capability. Uh, parachutes. I'm sure we talked about parachutes last time we were here, um, but this is this is an, uh, a very important part of our testing, as you all well know, especially if you remember the uh, the Apollo system. Um, uh, going, I mean, as soon as I got here in 2005 in Orion, we were doing. Um, uh, 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 parachute testing um, using using a uh, C-17 out at the Yuma Proving Ground out in Arizona. Um, we uh, formally, I guess, we had 17 or so uh, development tests. We had eight qualification tests, but but gosh, going back, I think we had 15 or 20 other drop tests out uh, out in Yuma, um, uh, working these. Um, you know, shaking down the deployment, uh, the reefing of these enormous parachutes. Um, I was, I had the, I had the, uh, the good pleasure to uh, to witness a number of those tests. It's just uh, remarkable the size of these things and uh, the size of these chutes. We of course have a uh, have a one shoot out capability for uh, for redundancy, um, but we have uh, we have shown a very robust uh, capability, which of course we've uh, we've shared that experience and data and whatnot with uh, the commercial partners, and uh, and you can see some similarities uh, in uh, in their in their um, uh, parachute systems as well. So we've worked very hard. This is a good example of how we've worked very hard to make the entire enterprise uh, successful across all elements of human. Human spaceflight and working closely with the uh, with the commercial side. Um, water impact tests is another important thing. We uh, after the STA uh, test campaign was done up in Denver, we actually shipped the crew module. Um, we reworked the uh, um, the heat shield a little bit, but uh, this is the the same heat shield structure, carrier structure. But we took the the STA the crew module out to um, Langley and. Um, and uh, and did some more drop tests with the full up flight uh, structure to be able to demonstrate. Turns out it's a very uh, it's a very complex interaction, you know, structural interaction uh, with uh, with water impact. Overall, though, over over the course of uh, we had a GTA, we had some earlier um, you know boilerplate uh, drop tests and all, but we've we've done 35 or so uh, drop tests out at uh, water impact drop tests down in. Um, at Langley, which was uh, which is a big part of our structural uh, certification, those were fun tests too. It makes quite a wave.
so yes um and uh, and of course the movie that we shot the video that we that we saw earlier um gave you a glimpse of uh, of what the uh, the launch abort system looks like and uh, and the interaction there um uh i just want to give you know, go through a sequence now of uh of, of how we're how we're built up to artemis one uh, back in 2016 um, this is what Artemis One crew module looked like. The the um, the pressure vessel, the the crew module pressure vessel that uh, direct from the welding operation at MAF in uh, in New Orleans. So, 2016 to um, you know to uh, to the the end of our um, our integration process. Obviously, um, uh, this was the first full up uh, flight uh, flight integration process, and of course, in parallel was uh, our qualification testing, which uh, which created a lot of um, complexity in in um, when and what uh, components to uh, uh, to install at any given time. Um, you can probably imagine, uh, especially first time through the avionics system, we we had to we had to deintegrate um, some components when we when we discovered things in our qualification tests along the way. So we had a little bit of rework um, as we uh, as we went through this, but uh, um, but um, but I think overall that integrate that interaction with uh, with qualification and and, and flight actually allowed us to um, to get to this point a little bit quicker than uh, than doing everything in series but uh, uh, but we made it um, the that was the crew module here is the service module um, at a uh, at a level of integration for an acoustic test that we did at the ONC down in uh, down in Florida here you can see the um, the 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 flight uh, the launch uh, configuration for the um, solar arrays folded up there. You can see the RCS in the 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 middle section. There is the European service module. The uh, the upper ring is the the crew module adapter that I mentioned earlier. Um, the uh, the acoustic operation down there was uh, we is uh, is actually a bank of. Uh, um, of, uh, of of speakers, loudspeakers that uh, that we got from a, a you know rock concert <laughs> producer. Uh, that they we also uh, they also do uh, the rock concerts when they're not doing testing for us. Um, but this was a this is a direct field acoustic test uh, capability. We found it to be very um, very efficient in terms of um, folding into our integration operation down in uh, down in Florida. We do this for. Service module. We do this for uh, crew module individually, um, you, but uh, give you that uh, that idea of, uh, of of DFAT. We do the, and this is the uh, test cell where we do the integration of the crew module with the service module. This is um, this is the Artemis One. Uh, I'll call it you know CSM um, integration that. Um, um, uh, that is the the last stage before we uh, we button this up and go to the next step. Um, Artemis One, the next step, um, Artemis One only actually. Um, we won't do this on all the flights, but Artemis One, the next step was to fly the CSM, the integrated CSM, up to the uh, the Plumbrook test facility up in Ohio. Now it's called the um, the Armstrong test facility. Uh, renamed in honor of Neil Armstrong, of course. And um, this was a uh, the once we got there, the tests were great, but the but the whole um, the whole Plumbrook uh, testing operation was a real adventure. First, to get up there, it turns out this CSM uh, was, well it was flown up on the Guppy, uh, and many of you have flown uh, flown things on the on the Guppy before. It turns out. This was the largest payload that the Guppy has uh, has has ever carried, and uh, and with that we had to make a, make a few a few structural mods, but did a whole bunch of analysis uh, to make sure that uh, um, that that uh, that we were flying within the capabilities of uh, of the Guppy, uh, and of course that team is just awesome in in their uh, their professionalism and getting us through that, and um, we had to fly it up to. Uh, um, uh, little airport in the middle of Ohio, Mansfield, and then uh, then we had to uh, drive the back roads to get up to Sandusky, where the uh, where the test facility is. So, 
Um, so that became quite an adventure for those communities that we uh, that we drove through and seeing this uh, this large payload. And we had quite a following of people out there uh, visiting us with their American flags and uh, and understanding you know help uh, uh, understanding the, uh, the the significance of uh, of what what they were witnessing through their own little hometown. So. Um, uh, so we we sent this up. Uh, help me out, Erica. We sent this up in um, in the, the latter part of 2019. I think November, December of 2019. We did the thermal vacuum tests and um, and uh, EMI EMC testing that we had planned. Um, tests went great. We it was actually about two months of uh, uh, at thermal vacuum conditions, and of course it was uh, it was cycling. It was hot and cold. We went through the the whole gamut of uh, of environments that we needed for our certification, um, and we were done in March of 2020. Well, guess what happened in March of 2020? As everyone remembers, um, uh, turns out that was uh, we were we were days away from um, you know from uh, not only our own our own guppy crew um, being uh, being you know needing to stand down for the for the pandemic, but all the Air Force. Um, uh, transportation uh, help that uh, that that we need along the way for refueling and uh, and managing the the cargo in and out, um, and uh, we we had to have a little visit with the the Secretary of Defense to make sure that we uh, we were able to have all of those capabilities, just a few more days longer to get uh, to get us back to uh, to Florida. We were really sweating, you know, getting this thing stranded halfway someplace and. Uh, and uh, and we were able to make it back and uh, back at the um, the ONC in Florida where we finished the um, where we finished the integration. Um, here you can see the, um, the the jettison panel stage for uh, for installation. You can see the flight uh, so, uh, uh, electrical um, you know solar arrays that uh, that are in launch configuration folded up there. RCS service uh, the crew module on top there. So. Um, and we, uh, so we, we took a couple of months to button it up, uh, for the launch configuration and we turned it over to the, um, to the KSC ground operations program, um, and, um, and drove it over to the MPPF, um, multi-purpose processing facility, multi-program, I'm not sure the, uh, but MPPF for, uh, hazardous commodity loading. So this is where we, we loaded the prop. And, um, and ammonia and um, and uh, and of course this is the first time we shook that out with that facility so uh, so we're, we're learning the, the the processes and interfaces along the way uh, from the MPPF we drove uh, drove that stack over to the uh, LASF the launch abort system facility we call it um, back in shuttle, this was the canister rotation facility. Some of you will remember that. Uh, so we've um, we've repurposed that for lot, uh, for last integration, and uh, and the final last stacking that uh, that occurred. Uh, it's not a great picture, but underneath that is the the crew and service module, um, and um, and once done with that, uh, back in. Um, October, right? Uh, October of last year, um, the, we rolled from the last F to the VAB. Um, just a little, uh, you know, just a, a little pause in this photograph. Um, some of you who remember the canister rotation facility uh, uh, intimately from the shuttle days might not remember that little cutout at the at the at the very top of the door there. That is a door cutout that we had to put in in order to do this operation with the. Uh, with a launch abort system as tall as it is, so um, so we've uh, we've adapted the fa the facilities down there to uh, to be able to take care of us. At the VAB, of course, you know, started what 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 has become a really magnificent um, you know emergence of this uh, of this uh, of this you know tremendous vehicle that we're uh, that we're all part of. Um, Obviously, preceding this in the VAB and parallel to everything I just described was the stacking operations for both the boosters and the in the core stage and all the integrated testing that the SLS had to do. Uh, this is the stacking of, uh, of Orion on top and uh, and buttoning it up 
um, demonstrating those interfaces, getting the purge operations going, and uh, and everything we did in the in the VAB for a number of number of months, um, and uh, culminating back in March of a couple of months ago with uh, with the first rollout of this, uh, which really became one of the most memorable days of my entire career of uh, seeing this enormous, enormous vehicle, you know, giving me a sense of what it was like in Apollo. Uh, of course, I wasn't here then, but uh, um, but seeing Orion at the top of this magnificent vehicle, it was really something. Um, and, um, you know, this was rollout day. Um, this is, you know, uh, finishing, you know, this is just getting to the to the pad, see the catenary terrors for uh, for um, uh, for lightning protection, which has become very, uh, we, we've demonstrated that already on the, on the pad. Um, you know, some of you know that we, uh, so we rolled this out in March. We, we did our first, uh, attempt at a wet dress rehearsal. This is the, uh, this is the countdown demonstration all the way fully, fully loading the, uh, the upper stage and the core stage tanks, um, all the way down to, but not including launch of, uh, obviously, um, uh, we tried that first uh, uh, first uh, attempt at wet dress rehearsal, the first part of April, if I remember right. Um, and um, you know, the purpose of this this is our this is the first fully integrated uh, interaction of the of the ground system with the uh, with the flight system. Um, uh, you know, the core stage had its uh, had its um, um, hot fire test in in. Uh, in uh, Stennis uh, a number of months ago, I forgot exactly which month, but a uh, number of months ago. So, you know, that part of the flight system was shook out, but this is the first time the, the core system, the upper stage, uh, and the, uh, and the, the, the brand new uh, ground systems are, were interacting. And of course, on this first attempt, we, uh, we started finding some of the, um, you know, the, the, the integration of the, of the, of the products, the, the hardware, the people, the, the, the procedures, and uh, and started seeing some of the uh, some of the lumps where uh, um, where we um, we didn't have the full purge capability the nitrogen purge capability um, we uh, we actually first started seeing a uh, a nitrogen purge capacity issue with our with our air liquid supplier down there which they have since uh, they have since addressed with the uh, uh, installing a, a higher capacity um, uh, capability. That we'll be using next time we uh, next time we do this. But uh, so our first attempt, um, uh, we started finding some of these configuration issues and and uh, the things that the wet rehearsal wet dress rehearsal is uh, is is, uh, is designed to do. Um, um, kind of as a as a as a demonstration of how busy things are down in Florida. Um, we actually had a fairly small window to do this first attempt at a wet dress, wet dress rehearsal because um, there were two launches uh, waiting um, waiting on the range, uh, and we uh, we actually had to stand down um, uh, for about a week, a little over a week, to uh, to let the let those rockets get off, and, uh, and then we got back to our second attempt at uh, wet dress rehearsal and. And um, and in doing that, we got further into the procedure. We and uh, and one of the things we discovered was uh, uh, was our, our our first indication of this um, helium um, uh, uh, check valve helium check valve on the on the ICPS that um, that was not functioning properly. And uh, and um, and and with and and we found some more configuration configuration issues on the uh, on the fuel uh, delivery side actually a vent valve on the uh, on the, uh, the on the hydrogen the hydrogen vent system uh, we did flow a little bit of oxygen but uh, but we had to uh, we had to uh, liquid you know liquid oxygen we had to suspend that and we and um, and um, as we kind of ran out of uh, ran out of opportunity on that particular day, the way that worked out, um, but we but but we also wanted to stop and uh, and use that opportunity to to configure the controls um, so that we uh, we 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 learned enough in flowing oxygen that day that we needed to tweak our our oxygen controls and. Um, 
a few days later, got into the third attempt, and um, we knew because of that helium valve, we weren't going to attempt to um, to fuel the ICPS, but we wanted to get as far into the into the into the locks and uh, and hydrogen um, fueling as we possibly could, and. Uh, we actually fueled that day about 50% fill on the on the locks, which is uh, which is planned, uh, you know, just shy of 50% uh, fuel. Start getting the structure to uh, to respond to the cryogenic temperatures, and uh, and we started flowing liquid hydrogen, which is where we um, where we discovered the uh, the hydrogen leak that uh, that many of you probably heard about at the uh, tail service mast that. Uh, that actually, you know, got us to our our stop point. Um, obviously, safe the system from that. We're not going to deal with uh, with hydrogen leaks, just like uh, just like we learned in the uh, in the shuttle program. So, um, we debated to fix that out of the pad, but we decided um, to go ahead and roll back to the VAB where we are right now, doing all the fixes on the on the ICPS. Uh, the the check valve was replaced. We replaced some QDs on that. Uh, we think that helium system is uh, is is very much good to go. Um, we discovered some FOD in that system, uh, so you know we're uh, we're seeing why that happened, um, and um, and the um, uh, we uh, very strongly believe the the hydrogen leak was on the ground side of the of the hydrogen system, so. Uh, we're finding some uh, some preload losses and bolts at flanges and uh, and other things that we're specifically addressing on the uh, on the ground side and uh, and that's all being buttoned up. Uh, we expect to roll back out to the pad on the 26th of this month and um, with wet wet dress rehearsal um, the, the next wet wet dress rehearsal window opening on. Um, on June 5th. So I just wanted to give you a sense of what we've been doing out on the pad with Artemis One. Um, I know that uh, that many of you have gone through um, very similar scenarios on other on other missions, and uh, and sure enough, is another example of how we're building on that experience. You know, meanwhile, um, as we as you know, with that, the launch date is moving out, of course. Um, but uh, but all this time, we have been. Um, We've been working to certify the flight control team, um, both on the FOD side, our side in the MER. Um, we've certified all the people. We're doing about two integrated sims a month just to keep proficiency and uh, and shake down, uh, you know, shake down the uh, the uh, the flight procedures and uh, and all that. So, so we're moving forward on uh, on Artemis One, getting you know, doing our best to. Uh, 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 to uh, to shake down this system, and of course we're going we're not going to go until we're satisfied. Uh, we understand all aspects of this system is ready um, for this first flight test. Earliest launch would be in the in the August time frame, and and you know there's a fighting chance of getting there. So that's where we're headed. So and we'll talk more. Well, I'm sure there's some questions that all that uh, that all that brought up, but. Uh, Artemis II is our first crew flight, as I mentioned. Um, this is our, our figure eight chart of the, of the flight. It's a much simpler trajectory um, because we're actually spending more time in low Earth orbit. Um, this is the first uh, this is the fir first flight with crew, but it's also the first flight with uh, with the full up integrated ECLIS system. Uh, we're spending time in uh, low Earth orbit before committing to lunar um, uh, to make sure um, that uh, that uh, the life support system is functioning properly. We have all the the controls and displays uh, active and that sort of thing. It gives us a it gives us uh, a short ramp to uh, you know to call loss of mission if we or, you know to abort the mission or cut the mission short if we need to. Um, but by doing that, we uh, we uh, um, we expend the last bit of uh, of ICPS push. Um, to a trajectory that gives us a uh, a free return trajectory around the around the moon. We won't go into lunar orbit. We'll do a free return, so we're always on the way back. Um, this uh, this loop takes us about 4,000 miles beyond the uh, the surface of the moon and uh, and bring us back to uh, to landing. Um, Artemis two hardware is at a very uh, a very high state of uh, of integration at this point. Um, the the crew module on the on the left was uh, two or three months ago, something like that. Uh, so this is this is we've progressed uh, uh, quite a bit from uh, from here. Right now, the uh, there's a lot more of the 
uh, of the prop um, uh, prop system, the lines and all that have been welded on the outside, the ECLIS lines and systems on the inside. Um, the crew module is in a is in the uh, uh, proof and link cell in the uh, in the ONC doing you know it's a it's a, a hardened uh, uh, room there that we do the high pressure um, you know gas uh, proof uh, proof testing leak testing and we're in the midst of uh, of prop testing right now uh, we'll be we'll be getting into uh, ECLIS um, ECLIS testing here shortly and we're on a path to do. Um, uh, to do our initial power on. So in, in the midst of all this, we're doing avionics installations and everything. We, we plan to do our initial power on of this, uh, of this crew module on the 27th of this month. So, uh, so we're, we're moving, uh, moving a pace on that. And of course, uh, here again, in parallel, we have some, um, some parallel qualification testing on ECLIS and all the new, and the, and the, the new hardware coming up. The European service module on the right-hand side was uh, was delivered back in October. October was a big month for us last year. Uh, it was delivered to us. We integrated very quickly the CMA on top. It's been through um, the, um, the the prop and Nicholas tube welding and proof testing. It's uh, it's in a um, it's in a lift cell right now, going through the the NDE from all that and making great progress uh, towards uh, the integration with the with the crew module. Later on this year, um, Artemis three. So this is one, as Stokes said, I'm, I'm closest to know the most about. But uh, Artemis three um, uh, is is our our um, our integrated uh, uh, integrated flight with the uh, with the first lander. Um, we will we will meet up with the lander in um, in 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 lunar orbit. Um, uh, this orbit is called a uh, near rectilinear halo orbit. Um, this is the orbit that uh, that was chosen uh, for the um, for the gateway. It's a very very stable orbit, uh, very low in er energy to uh, to maintain this orbit. Uh, it gives us constant communication with the Earth. There's no blackouts there. There's no eclipses um, uh, that we have to deal with. So it uh, it lends itself very much to quiescent operations, which we need for. Um, for for the gateway and for leaving the, um, the 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 Orion you know the Orion crew you know CSM at the um, at that location with uh, with the right environment a quiescent environment to operate for a long period of time so um, so and like I said this would be uh, the Orion will stay in orbit in this in this um, NRHO orbit while the lander goes down for about a seven day. Uh, we believe about a seven-day operation at the South Pole, and um, and then back up for um, you know for our uh, our lunar return. Kind of a, a thumbnail of uh, of that. Uh, let's see. And we're well into the uh, into the production of this uh, of this crew module. Um, Stokes alluded to it, but this this is the first build of our of our of a new follow-on contract, a production contract that uh, uh, that we established with uh, with Lockheed Martin. Uh, this gives us the sustained uh, production. Um, we have uh, we have we have contract uh, provisions to uh, to drive the cost down quite a bit. Where uh, this first unit will. We believe will will come in around 50% the uh, of the of the cost of building the um, the Orion on on uh, Artemis II. Uh, this is a photograph taken um, about a month ago, something like that. So since then, there's been a lot of aft bay um, secondary structure and bracketry installations on the on the crew module. The CMA is in another part of the ONC, uh, going through the same operation. You'd see uh, it, you see it starting to take form. We have um, we have some of the the uh, the aft walls and forward walls installed. We're working on the outboard walls. We have some of the interior um, uh, harnessing and, uh, and tubing already installed on the on the CMA. The right hand side shows a, a recent picture from the European service module at the at the um, the Airbus Bremen uh, Bremen Germany factory for uh, for Artemis III, the, uh, for the European service module number three ESM three is what they call it. So we're making great progress there, um, and uh, and just one more step, Artemis IV, similar thing. We go into NRHO, but this is our first 
um, co-manifested payload uh, mission where we will take one of the gateway elements, the international hab, international habitat module, habitation module, uh, we will um, transport it out, push it, push it out to the the uh, um, NRHO orbit for uh, for installation on the gateway, and uh, and the gateway has a mixture of uh, of, of expendables and uh, and and Orion to uh, to take elements out there for its buildup. So. So it's actually kind of building up while we're doing um, our, our initial transportation demonstration flights. Um, and sure enough, we, uh, we're making progress already on the Artemis IV. This is on the left-hand side, this is a picture of, um, from MAF of the, of the forward uh, weldment for the, the crew module. This is the tunnel in the forward bulkhead. We're getting ready in a few days to do, uh, to do one more weld, the barrel to the aft bulkhead. And, and on the right-hand side, and in the, the structural uh, assembly factory in uh, at Tazi in um, in Torino, Italy, so it's uh, uh, it's making progress as well. So, so we're and and honestly, we're building parts for Artemis V. Um, some of those parts are coming through the uh, through those uh, the machine shops right now. So, um, so that was the whole point of establishing the um, uh, establishing the. Uh, production contract is to start getting on to a, an annual cadence of building. Um, we're engaging the supply chain in a much more efficient way, buying you know buying some of these uh, these parts and services in bulk, so we get better pricing, and that's a that's a major major lever of, uh, of driving our costs down. Uh, so yeah, um, kind of to to end up this uh, this part of the discussion, um, these are some uh, some some strategy charts that. Um, that we've used to talk about the whole uh, the whole strategy. I've talked about the the transportation um, the transportation part of the uh, the exploration infrastructure. You can see on that on the swoosh across the top of what I've uh, what I've just described: Artemis one, two, and three, uh, Orion system tests um, uh, with the gateway starting to be built up in parallel. But also on the surface, um, you know, we are. Uh, we are starting some of the precursor missions through another program called the CLIPS, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services uh, program that, that many of you are probably very familiar with, probably much more familiar than I, uh, starting with some small landers, building up to, um, you know, to instruments, uncrewed landing demonstrations in larger scale, um, uh, getting to the Artemis III timeframe where we'll get our first crew uh, lander capability on the surface and, uh, and beyond that, um, beyond Armist three and four, uh, more and more um, uh, interactions at the uh, at the gateway. The gateway will start getting um, more staging capability to sort of space space and do refueling of uh, of, uh, of landing systems, so that we're uh, we're starting to realize the efficiencies of uh, of space based uh, operations, and we uh, and we work towards a transportation infrastructure of getting. Uh, you know, getting the commodities to and from the gateway uh, with those uh, with those systems more efficiently, and you know the first uh, the first part of really scaling up the uh, the agency's commitment to uh, commercial services on the on the surface. And you hear you hear the administration talking a lot more about that, where we're starting to scale up on lunar terrain vehicles. Uh, uh, getting more capability of pressurized uh, rover operations to get uh, large and uh, you know, get long and uh, long duration and long distance uh, sortie capabilities, uh, starting to build surface habitation uh, capabilities to so start building a, a lunar outpost as the uh, um, as the twenties unfold and uh, and start building that uh, that longer range. Um, uh, operations experience that uh, that uh, uh, that gives us the uh, the confidence to start committing to uh, ultimately to Mars missions in the um, in the the mid to late uh, 2030s. And of course, you see Mars up there in the corner is the ultimate goal, really, of our exploration infrastructure uh, and our infra. Uh, so. So that's uh, that's it. This is kind of a glamour shot of Artemis One on the on the pad. I love this photograph. They they uh, of course you know Kennedy has some great uh, has some great uh, sunsets, and we got a got a great shot of the of the vehicle on the pad. We're building up this infrastructure. We're uh, we're building for the future, and um, 
and uh, and working very closely with the other programs to start um, to start into this uh, this Artemis campaign of lunar exploration. So, so Stokes, that's kind of what I uh, what I wanted to leave with and and uh, open it back up to um, to questions, and we can have a conversation here. Okay, thanks, Paul. That was really a great summary of the Artemis status. Now, I think you covered everything we were interested in seeing. And, and great. More, actually, That's, that was great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's open it <laughs> up. Kind of a mouthful. I was looking at this camera, and, and you know, I wasn't, wasn't getting much response out of this camera, but, uh, but uh, and I hope the audio was good. So, yeah, yeah. I think everything seemed to go real well. Uh, so, Dave, if you could unmute everybody and we can open it up to questions. So, anyone have a question or comment? Paul, are these Orion spacecraft reusable? The crew module. Yes. The crew modules are. We uh, uh, we will we have a small amount of reuse that uh, that will that we start with Artemis one. Um, we uh, a long time ago we made we call it a, a, a classification of our, our um, avionics we call them non-core so the non um, not you know the uh, portions of our avionics system we're going to reuse from Artemis one to Artemis two um, unfortunately that creates a, that creates a an iron bar you know distance between the two and we have to have about two years of uh, of uh, of launch to launch uh, to be able to do that but starting Artemis two. Uh, we're using, we're, we'll be disassembling um, much of the, um, of, the, of the life support system, much of the uh, avionics system and using those parts on Artemis 5. We call that, you know, we call that an inventory reuse uh, capability. Um, and then in our first production unit, starting with Artemis 3, um, we plan to use the, uh, the, the, uh, the entire crew module structure and all with a minimum of, of disassembling uh, from Artemis three to Artemis six. If you look at the annual cadence, we're able to we're able to skip over. Um, right now, we're building three flight units that will uh, that will that will reuse in sequence that way. Um, as we uh, um, as we as we work through some of the um, uh, the realities of that manifest and um, and getting some schedule robustness, we actually might build a fourth. Uh, uh, crew module, you know, full of crew module that we'll use in that module reuse mode uh, to give us a little bit more flexibility to hold our um, our uh, our mission cadence, if you will. But uh, but that's a very big part of our transition to um, to production. A very big part of what I pay attention to is uh, is um, working through the details then of uh, how we go about doing that uh, that refurbish uh, between flights and once we get to three doing a minimum of um, of disassembly and doing the uh, the checkouts and refurbishment that we need on 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 board and uh, making that part of the um, the outlaw flow to the next flight thank you very much and by doing that we save about half uh, another half of uh, of the the cost of building up a brand new uh, brand new crew module. So it's a it's a major lever lever in our uh, affordability push towards the future. Thank you. This is Bob Rand. Uh, Paul, excellent. Hello, Bob. Excellent presentation. You guys have Thank you, talked with us Apollo people uh, about what we did and why we did it and so forth. And I guess I kind of forgot. Uh, specifically, why did you not use Chamber A in Building 32 for your uh, back test? You remember we ran uh, Spacecraft 2TV1 in there with full crew for eight days and tied in to, through the uh, tunnels over to Mission Control with uh, Lunny and so forth. Uh, why did you not use Chamber A? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I, I've forgotten all the rationale. I I, I can tell you. We had uh, we did a trade study. Both Chamber A and um, and um, you know, Plumbrook uh, facilities needed a, a fair amount of refurbishment and upgrade to be able to do that uh, do the the testing that we needed. Um, we did a trade. Um, we uh, um, there's a there's a, the agency um, had uh, had a need to um, to to uh, you know to 
invest in infrastructure in a strategic way. Uh, so it wasn't it wasn't strictly a, an Orion decision. Um, we, the agency, decided to uh, to do to put those in, uh, upgrade investments up at the uh, the facility at uh, at Plumbrook that gave us that gave us the thermal vacuum, the EMINC. Um, we have a, a full a full spacecraft. Um, vibration facility up there um, so so all there in one facility uh, some capabilities that uh, that were a little a little more dispersed than um, you know than 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 here at JSC so it was a it was a strategic decision about uh, about about investments that ultimately decided it but we should, we absolutely considered it and 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 I can tell you, you know, I had a number of or, uh, I just hit the uh, microphone sorry about that I probably made some noise uh, I did a number of tests in Chamber A and uh, and I would have loved to uh, been able to do one more Orion test in uh, in Chamber A too so okay great thank question you. though thank you Paul yes sir hey, Paul John Casper um, hey, great presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, how about Gateway and HLS? Are they going to be ready when, when everybody else is ready? Well, there's the question, John. Uh, it's, um, you know, we're really, really just now um, getting, you know, full uh, appropriations and authorization authority for those. Um, as you know, we, uh, we chose one um, uh, HLS provider. The agency is working towards a second HLS provider uh, within, you know, within the, the, those limited resources. Gateway has started um, their 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 procurement and uh, and making great progress in the international agreements that we need for IHAB and some of the other uh, other other parts. I'm not as versed in that, uh, so I, you know, for, forgive me on on the not knowing all the details. But they're making progress on those on those agreements um, with the uh, with the international partners. Um, but I know some of the early development um, with the uh, with the first gateway, um, the first gateway along with the uh, PPE, the, the power, uh, power and propulsion element, I believe is what it's called. Uh, they've had some de some delays and, um, and uh, in working through those so so like a lot of uh, human space flight development, um, you know, pushing the the technology on performance and other things, um, um, uh, and they are they are engaging the supply chain at a time uh, that is uh, is very very vulnerable. Um, I can tell you our transition to uh, to production, where we're really depending on on the supply chain to um, to ramp up uh, to and to uh, to be robust. Um, it, there's been a lot of problems, you know, coming out of uh, getting through and then coming out now of the uh, of the pandemic. You probably have all heard about uh, labor shortages and labor dynamics, just people moving around, and uh, uh, it's it's creating a lot of instability uh, at a time when we need stability, and in, uh, in our supply chain, because as you know, a lot of our parts are are uh, specialty parts. Uh, we we depend on the um, on the uh, on the corporate memory and experience that we uh, that we invested in and 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 acquired through uh, through hard knocks through development and and um, you know um, when it's um, when that gets to uh, gets diluted a little bit as we go into production um, that uh, you know that uh, that sets us back a little bit slows us down um, but then um, I and I know the Gateway folks have had some of that, you know, that you know some of that uh, challenge as well, John. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I'm suspecting that the uh, the Team Ray was tied up with upgrades for the Webb Telescope and scheduling for Webb Telescope. It might have been hard to schedule in there. I, I I was struggling to hear that. Um, it was a little bit muffled. I'm sorry. Could could you repeat that? The Chamber A has been involved with the Webb Telescope and upgrades, major upgrades for Webb Telescope. It might not have been able to uh, possible to schedule in there at the same time. Yeah, I, and, and and you're right. I do remember that. Um, and if the timing was somewhat different, we might have taken advantage of what uh, what they needed to do pre to prepare for uh, for James Webb. Um, but you're right. You're right. Hey, 
if all is going yeah, I, Chad, if you're talking, uh, you're on mute. Got to, got to understand the procedure. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I sure do. How are you? Oh, so outstanding briefing. Uh, you Thank guys you, uh, got a big, big load to carry. Uh, the question I have is: Are you trying to do? Do you have a common contractor that's collecting up all these parts, or how, what? What? What's your philosophy going into, into, into building the subsequent hardware like you built the first hardware, and being sure that it is? You're talking, Chad, about the rest of the, rest of the uh, exploration infrastructure with gateway, landers, et cetera. Yeah, so, so, so far, we are not taking the, the attack of having a single contractor do all of that integration. Um, um, headquarters is going through a reorganization right now. What we used to know is HEO has been split. Um, there is a, there is a, um, there is a, uh, uh, ESDMD, you know, there's an exploration systems development mission directorate and an operations mission directorate. Um, and, um, and within the, um, the exploration systems directorate, um, we are establishing an infrastructure of integration that, uh, um, that will have, um, um, that will have, that will have, you know, joint, you know, that will have central authority for, for conducting the, um, you know the uh, the integration analysis work and uh, and authority for uh, for 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 making decisions will be drawing from the integration infrastructure established in each of the programs, kind of building on 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 the way that we have integrated within ESD so far between uh, Orion SLS and EGS. Um, um, but as uh, but of course it gets more it gets more. Um, uh, uh, complicated with a lot more moving parts and a lot more constraints, and uh, and that infrastructure is being laid in right now. Thank you. Under um, see it's uh, it's, uh, it's so Jim Free is now the, uh, the 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 director the the AA for the ESC. I'm sorry the Exploration Systems Development uh, Mission Directorate. And under, uh, under him is, uh, is of course, um, you know, Tom, uh, Tom Whitmire, where we are. And, uh, and then there's this, uh, uh, it's called Artemis Capability, ACD, Ar Artemis Capability Division, uh, led by Mark Kirasich, our, our former program manager. So, so that, part of the, that part of the organization that will be doing all this Artemis integration knows Orion very, very well. And, uh, and that's, uh, uh, you know, we're drawing on that experience as well. Hey, Paul, it's Phil Engeloff. I've always been intrigued by this rectilinear halo orbit, and I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is, in the absence of the, the, uh, the HAB in orbit, the, uh, the gateway, does the halo orbit is that still a driver? Um, what's the rationale in the absence of having the gateway, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. And then a second part of that question, is there is there any good technical reference that's publicly available that I could read up on the orbital mechanics of this halo orbit and, and how it's uh, uh, how it got selected and, and why that makes sense? Yeah, good. Uh, so how you doing, Phil? It's good to see you. Um, so um great question um and uh, uh I, I i think actually getting to your to, to the point you know the simple answer is um to do uh, to do a, an apollo style landing mission we probably wouldn't use um the the um, nra challenge um it 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 gives us capability um it does give us capability though um for uh, for a lot more flexibility in 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 planning landing, uh, uh, you know, landing locations, landing targets, it gives us global access because of the nature of that. Uh, um, uh, it, so it gives us global access from uh, from from a stable uh, orbital uh, orbiting point. It um, uh, so all that energy doesn't have to be carried from the you know, from the Earth to be able to go to you know, do all that. Um, it uh, like I said. It's um, it's it, it's very good in that the uh, the, the the remaining parts in orbit uh, um, 
in any way that we did it, uh, Orion was going to stay in orbit. Um, uh, it was uh, Orion will would always be Gateway will always be in communication um, with the Earth. Uh, there's no there's no eclipses. It's very very stable, uh, and uh, uh, but like I said, uh, no matter where we are in the uh, in in the in in the monthly procession, um, and um, and uh, and no matter where we are in that orbit, it gives us global access. It gives us global return. Uh, there are some there are some uh, you know some uh, some benefits. Now, the source. I'll have to look into that, um, Phil. Um, that uh, you probably guessed that's not my my direct domain, being a you know, being a, a mechanical engineer and life support guy, but uh, uh, but I'll find that out for you because um, I want to do the same thing. Yeah, it'd be great if there was a you know orbital mechanics twenty one oh two out there for rectilinear halo orbits. But... Yeah, good, good. I'll I'll look for it. I okay. will I will find something. Appreciate it, Paul. There may be some questions on chat if you want to take a look at it, or anybody that's posted a question on chat, just open your mic and ask. Oh, Mr. Abby. Ah, oh gosh. So, Mr. Abby asks, um, possibly what NASA uses a back of the Chinese, I don't know how to pronounce it, um, relay satellite for the Chang'e lunar mission that has entered the, entered the planned halo orbit around the second Lagrange point of the Earth-Moon system. Um, yeah, could, for safety purposes, could the Chinese Kikayo, um help provide communications relay needs. Uh, it's, uh, it, that, is, that is a great question. Um, and um, honestly, I don't, know, I don't know how to answer it right this second. I, I love the description though. It gives a functional redundancy at a different location. Um, uh, obviously we have to work through the, uh, the international partnership and the, and the, and the um, you know, the, the, the uh, the the political constraints that we've had in working with uh, working with the Chinese, but uh, I personally am confident that uh, that w that we will work through that one day. Um, Mr. Abby, it's um, you want to come on and and and, and uh, elaborate that more. Um, I just would say that uh, since it's in a halo orbit, it is um, in a L to the Grange point. Uh, it's functioning uh, to support that particular rover that the Chinese have. And when they're not utilizing it, and you do need to have possibly for safety purposes, communication yeah, yeah. Earth, one would say, just like you answered, you know, uh, things that, you know, we do in space can greatly benefit um, others here on Earth related to the political equation, related to the partnership, you know, and um, de-escalate, you know, um, uh, causing people to feel like they are minimalized and uh, could contribute to a program that's international. All I'm just saying is that, you know, it does exist, it's there. Um, we'd be real keen to recognize that there is such a, Halo orbit uh, established now. Yeah, yeah, that I really love how you described that, and I think that that becomes an opportunity for us that I hope we can we can take advantage of as uh, as the future unfolds. Thank you. So, Paul, uh, uh, did, did I understand you to say that the command the service module is using? Ohm's engines as propulsion. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, orbiter head two, right? To one on each uh, each uh, each side of the t the tail section. Um, we have uh, so we have that inventory of uh, of Ohm's engines coming out of orbiter, and uh, and uh, on each one of our, our missions, we will uh, we will fly one of those uh, at the at the back of the service module. Now, to do that, uh, we. Uh, we went into a major refurbishment operation because uh, um, we needed to, you know, they were, you know, the the heritage was uh, was there, the flight experience was there. They'd also been setting for uh, for uh, for a number of years as we uh, as we picked them up. 
uh, we needed to validate the, uh, the integrity of the valves, the seals, and other things because of our leakage requirements. Um, um, if you remember how those are, those are controlled with, uh, with high pressure nitrogen, uh, they've got to be very tight if we're going to take that to, uh, uh, to a planetary destination where we're not a, a couple of hours away from home, right? Um, so, you know, so some of the calculus uh, changed a little bit on, uh, on, on how we were configured uh, for, the, uh, for those engines. And sure enough, as we, as we pulled those, uh, those individual valves off, uh, you know, we, we found a number of, uh, of, of challenging, um, um, uh, you know, conditions that we, uh, that we had to work through. Uh, we were working with Aerojet, Vaco, some of the original manufacturers of those valves. Um, of course, they had to sort of recover some of their own experience, um, tooling and whatnot, to uh, to be able to dig into those valves. Um, so it was a bit of a as 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 Walt Guy taught me in the early days. You know, it's um, uh, heritage hardware is not a slam dunk necessarily, and. Uh, and sure enough, we, um, we found out our own adventure in refurbishing those. Um, uh, but of course, those are work for, workhorse uh, engines. You know, they were, they were incredibly uh, reliable uh, in the orbiter program, in the shuttle program, and, uh, and we expect the same in using them in a, in a refurbished mode. We have enough you know, of those engines, you know, we've expended some in testing and whatnot. We have enough of those engines to, uh, to get us through Artemis VI. That will be the last Ohms engine. Um, I mentioned earlier that uh, that we just in the last uh, in the last six months or so started a uh, uh, a remanufacturing contract with Aerojet. Um, we're going through the early stage of um, of of proving the manufacturing of uh, you know the modern manufacturing of getting into those. And obviously, we don't need it. We don't need some of the reuse uh, features um, that uh, that were built into those engines, but uh, but we're working to uh, try as much as possible hitting the form, fit, and function of uh, of uh, of the orbiter ohms. Um, same with the uh, thrust vector controllers. Actually, uh, we had we had more problems using the orbiter thrust vector controller, and we had to we had to put it back into manufacturing earlier. But uh, um, but we're doing our best to use that uh, that inventory of hardware, and uh, and looking forward to. I, I don't remember. I don't remember the last flight of this of the Artemis One's Ohms engine, um, and the, the last shuttle flight. But by the time we get there, I will know that, and that will be part of our story. Is uh, is from STS whatever to Artemis One, you know. Um, and of course, the uh, the SRBs have have heritage. The uh, as you saw in the in the in the video, and and most of you already know the the RS twenty fives all have shuttle uh, shuttle flight heritage. And those engines are, are being put back into manufacturing as well, too, right now. Thank you, right Thanks. Paul, Paul I, I got a question on the differences between the Orion uh, test articles or articles for, uh, for Artemis 1 through 4 uh, structure and outfitting. I, at last I worked, it was about 9, 10 years ago. But uh, wondering what those differences turned out to be now. And, and specific to Artemis one, the two, the three, the four. Yeah, for for Orion, the structure for and Orion the outfitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and th and this is Dave asking the question, right? I couldn't tell yeah. exactly who. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. So, if you remember, if you worked at you know nine years ago, you remember when we started, we had a number of configurations. We had a, we had a completely uncrewed cargo configuration. Our first mission was was space station servicing, right? Before uh, before we had a full commitment to the to commercial, you know that was a configuration with six crew to and from station. Um, um, uh, you know, in all of the the various you know manifestations of our mission definition and program definition, and of course we were canceled in '93 and that sort of thing. We've become very focused on the deep space uh, deep space mission, which we we're always designing for, as you know. Um, so, so really, when you get to when you get to the core the core systems, you mentioned structures and, and that sort of thing. Um, very, very much, you know, very close uh, to the um, Artemis. Uh, how, do, how do I say this? The Artemis One um, primary structure you know, that that 
is almost completely replicated. You know that 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 is very has changed very little from Artemis one to two three. So um, so it's fully certified. And we did as we started bringing on some of the capabilities that we're defining you know defining recently. We did have to make some small changes to primary structure in the tunnel area, a little bit in the forward bulkhead area, just kind of beefing up certain, you know, certain hot spots that we found once we once we laid in the docking, you know, function. Um, not 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 uh, not just the docking operation, but uh, but carrying the mass of the docking mechanism and other things. Um, so we had to make some minor changes there as we start bringing on crew. Um, we're putting in full capabilities for, um, oh, for, um, you know, for hatch pressure equalization that required some slight changes to the primary structure and in, in the barrel sections and all that. But those are very, very small changes. Um, so largely structure, you know, uh, structure moves forward with, uh, with very few changes. Uh, we, we cut our teeth on structure in the early builds, the GTAs and the STAs. Um, uh, if you remember the GTA, for example, had, yeah. you know, we, we welded together it, uh, something like 37 parts, 37 parts, you know, the, 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 the um, Londrons and the, and the, you know, we had six conical sections and other things, you know, so um, our, our producibility um, uh, maturity uh, has, uh, has, has evolved now to seven parts make up that primary structure. Um, whereas, you know, so, so we've, we've simplified, we've simplified the weld operations. We put more complexity in, you know, upstream into the parts manufacturing, uh, which, uh, which those machine shops, the particular machine shops, not everybody can do it, but the machine shops we found are able to do it and do it very reliably. You know, they're delivering those conical, those very complex conical parts with no, no discrepancies. It's uh, it's amazing what what they're doing. Yeah. But but uh, structure hasn't changed much. So Artemis One power system doesn't won't won't change uh, hardly at all. Um, we're not flying the whole Eclipse. We do have we do have thermal control. Um, so you know we have active thermal for avionics and that sort of thing. Where we have those those thermal interfaces and the and the flow controls, the pump packages and that sort of thing that get uh, get back to the service module radiators. All that is the same from flight to flight now. Um, other parts of the Eclipse are coming online on Artemis II. Uh, they'll, they'll fly first on Artemis II. Come Artemis III and out, they're the same. Um, we, we plan very little changes to, uh, uh, to, those, uh, to those systems, um, if any. And, 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 uh, um, and mostly based on, you know, based on, Flight experience, you know, the, we're we're gonna we're gonna shake them out. We're gonna see uh, we're gonna see how they perform, uh, but we plan very few changes from uh, from flight to flight on on those systems. Now, from so so one to two is it, we're bringing on crew, so that's life support. It's also crew systems. You know, it's the it's the uh, it's the adding on the crew displays so the crew can interact with the avionic system, the the hand controllers, the the crew displays, the switch panels, and other things. That's all new on Artemis II. Um, obviously, habitability, the 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 potty, the 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 WCS will fly first on Artemis II. Um, the galley and you know food storage, all that stuff, right? Um, um, all that's all that's you know it's uh, we we plan that to stay stable going uh, going forward. Um, um, where we get some mission specific. Um, configuration or, or things like bringing on, on docking and rendezvous proximity operations and docking on Artemis III. Um, we expect once we, have, once we fly it on three, every single mission that we're gonna have will involve docking in one sort or another, whether it's a uh, um, co-manifested payload like I talked about, uh, where we're pushing a, an element out to gateway or any other mission that we might have, um, or just simply docking to the gateway. You know, we'll, we'll always be docking or you know, with the gateway or with the lander itself directly. Um, um, uh, so Artemis four and out, um, you know, we we're evolving some of the pro you know, propellant systems on the, on the, on the service module. Obviously it has to be built, you know, it has to be built new every, every flight um, since it's expanded during, uh, during entry, uh, just before entry. And, um, 
so there's some evolution on the on the prop system a little bit that we're working with the Europeans, but uh, um, and uh, like I mentioned on Artemis Seven, uh, Artemis Seven will be the first flight of the of the new uh, main engine. You know, you know, we're still using Ohm's engine in, in describing our main engine for the first six flights. We call the the seven and out engine called the uh, uh, the Orion main engine, just to you know OME instead of OMS, right? So OME flies first on Artemis Seven. That's a big change for the for the service module, but um, but really we're we're working we're working hard to stabilize this design so we can produce it reliably, and on an annual cadence, and for much less uh, you know uh, much less cost. So landed mass margins looking pretty good. I think as as I recall, we were having problems with that before just before I left and talking about yeah. Uh, proposals of taking mass out of the structure and and all of that after there yeah and i don't remember when yeah i don't remember where nine years ago was in that in that but yes we were we were stuck actually and uh, and really did a major mass scrub um in those in those early days <clears throat> um right now so uh, for artemis 3 artemis 4 we're sitting slightly over our our our, uh, our our certified you know ideal landing mass landed mass by a, a 100 pounds 200 pounds something like that um, um, we had a discussion at our board today just to, you know because because you know some of our good ideas to fix things um, you know add a pound or two or ten here or there and uh, you know so uh, uh, so we're we're reinvigorating keeping you know invigorated that uh, that mass control um but we know we've got margin on um, on our on our landed mass um parachute capabilities etc and uh and we're keeping our pencils sharp and obviously as we fly each flight we're going to understand um, how much of that margin we absolutely have to have okay good to hear thank you so paul how about three ops related questions where's the mission control room Where's the MER and where's the Orion simulator? <laughs> Let's see. Um, so um, the Artemis, so Artemis has um, has a control room um, that's uh, that's been repurposed from the. I, uh, so folks like Phil are sitting there and they, they know all the names of the of the rooms over there. But you know, one of the mission control rooms now has been purposed for uh, for Artemis or Artemis missions. And, uh, and and we're using that all the time for uh, for for simulations and flight following of some of the integrated testing down at the Cape and and that sort of thing um, when it's not when it's not needed for um, for space station missions um, we have a MER in, you know down the hall from that um, so mission evaluation room that uh, that's that's you know it's never as big as we want right. Um, um, but uh, but we have the full complement, including the Europeans um, that can be in place there. We have some back rooms from that uh, in the MCC. Um, we also have a capability uh, up at up at Lockheed, um, where where they will get um, all of the uh, all of the flight data. Um, I'm, I'm sure you know they uh, they have. They do a lot of uh, of mission operations up there with uh, with their JPL missions and and other um, other you know uh, unmanned uh, uh, unmanned missions and uh, so they have quite an infrastructure up there and and much of our um, of our system tracking uh, capability will be there with communications back back to our MER at the same time so so we have that infrastructure as well. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> Sorry, I can't be more specific. I'm sure and, there's. And, uh, and, and the, the where's the uh, training? Uh, the, the, ah, the, the trainer. Sorry, sorry. Yes, we. Um, of course, we're not using a trainer for Artemis One. Um, we are bringing online a a uh, starting with a basic trainer in Building Five. Um, um, so building up. Uh, so we have a. Uh, we have a we have a an Orion in the box computer capability right that has all the emulators. Uh, we'll have we'll have uh, we'll have a set of avionics uh, displays and all that the crew can interact with. Um, it's not motion based, <laughs> but uh, won't need to be. Um, but we're bringing you know that's being that's being built up right now by uh, 
uh, by FOD, and the, and they'll they'll be coming online for uh, in time for Artemis II crew training um, coming up here in the next few months. And you know we uh, we also have um, a, a lot of use of the MBL too uh, with a, with a kind of a boilerplate capability. We do some we do some uh, oh um, you know crew recovery kinds of demonstrations there. Uh, so we use some of the F FOD infrastructure in in in, in the uh, in the MBL. Paul, oh, this is Bob Wren again. As a point of clarification, when we did Apollo spacecraft two TV one in Chamber A, we had a full crew in there of Joe Kerwin, Vance Brand, and Joe Engel. When you ran your vacuum test uh, up in uh, Plumbrook, you were not manned. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank we you. were not. Thank you. Like I said, we're we're um, we're fully um, fully autonomous, fully automatic. So we're able to control the whole system. Um, I'm not I'm not deep enough into Apollo to know how much of it had to be um, you know crew operated. My understanding was it, it required the crew to to really operate we the had, system. We but, had uh, uh, we we had pace equipment uh, on board uh, with the uh, Rockwell crew and tied into mission control. It was just like we were flying. And it was a constraint yeah. on Apollo Seven and Apollo Eight, so it's just like we were flying a mission. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, but that does require a lot of capability in the in the facility too to keep the crew safe. And uh, and we did not do that. We didn't feel the need to do that uh, for for our purposes, but given I, where we are in our in, in our crew interaction. I understand. Yes, Thank sir. you. Hey, on a, a related question, are we pressurizing Artemis One for that flight and monitoring the pressure on it oh yeah oh yeah our right. atmosphere control is uh, pressure control is uh, is there positive pressure and let negative pressure controls but but active controls uh, with uh, um with uh, oxygen and nitrogen yeah yeah but that'll sure serve, are. that'll serve a little bit for uh, some validation as well then yes very much so very much so but uh the pressure control is very much a part of that mission yeah do we have the real hatches on that now i think that was a point nine or 10 years ago, we were looking at cover plates instead of actual hatches. Let's see, we have a, a docking hatch, but I, 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 uh, I believe we don't have a full up um, side hatch um, that, will, that, that will be a full up side hatch for, uh, for Artemis II, of course. Yeah. So that might be a little bit of a difference between the, the two as far as that pressure capability is concerned. Yes. Oh, we've we hit we passed our four o'clock deadline. Uh, not deadline, but four o'clock. I know you're getting a little tired. So, do we have any any last <laughs> questions for, for? No, I'm happy to do it. I'm getting my second wind. All right. Could you put up your happy. last slide with all the references and the links? Oh yeah, Brad, can you help me? Stand by just a second. Yep. I think there might have been. Of course, been I can send that. I can, I can, I can send that to uh, Stokes or David uh, uh, to distribute around. But absolutely. Yeah, I think there might have been another uh, chat question. I don't know that we got. Uh, oh, really? I missed that. No, I was just waving at everybody. Oh, hello. Okay. Yeah, Dan, did you have a question? Did you want to? Dan. Yeah. Yeah, I was just uh, asking how, Paul, how automated is the crew module uh, compared to the SpaceX crew module? Yeah, Dan, uh, that's a good question. And I'm probably not the best guy to answer because my impression is um, SpaceX is 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 significantly more autonomous than uh, than Orion. Uh, um, but uh, but again, yeah, especially for emergency uh, things, that sort of thing. Uh, I think there's less reliance on crew interaction in SpaceX, um, but uh, but please don't hold me to that. I you know we uh, we have we have um, you know we have our uh, our our active displays you know three active displays with a whole raft of uh, of um, of display formats that we're building uh, that uh, that allows the crew to interact with all systems. We also have some hard switching for. Uh, for emergency uh, capability that uh, 
Um, and I'm just not deep enough on, on, uh, on, on SpaceX to really, uh, to really peel that back for you. But that's just, my impression is that, um, is that uh, they're more autonomous. Hey, thank you. Okay. Uh, do we need do we need to put that um, that that uh, that display back up or is it still up? Yeah, it's still. Oh, it up. is up. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. okay yeah. Well, Paul, thank you very much. This was a great, great, great briefing. Uh, good presentation. I think it definitely answered all the questions we had. Uh, and good, good last minute status on on Artemis One. So appreciate that. So uh, well, good. My pleasure. My pleasure, and it's uh, it's really a joy to talk to this group. I wish we could be together um, and uh, and socialize. Uh, I know what comes next, you know, in a normal meeting, uh, but uh, but hopefully we'll we'll join you um, uh, as uh, as time goes on. But uh, but yeah, it's an it's an exciting time, and I know we're building on on the uh, on the accomplishments that you all had in your careers, and uh, and uh, we're looking forward to. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, to enjoying that, um, you know, with you, and hopefully some of you can be at the Cape. But uh, but for sure, um, uh, this is going to be a big national event um, on on television, and and uh, uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh boy, is it! And and you know, we're all rooting for you. We appreciate you taking us to the moon and beyond. Um, okay, but, uh, great talking to you, everybody. Okay, so uh, D David, you can go ahead and uh, stop the recording. And.